All right, hello, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us in our weekly hangout. <clears throat> Let me actually just look at my video, make sure we're coming through. We should be, but take a quick peek here so I just don't talk to the uh, empty space. Okay, yep, <clears throat> looks good. And let me turn my volume off. All right, so again, uh, really appreciate uh, everybody taking the time out again. We do this every Friday, uh, always same time, same place, unless you hear otherwise. So kind of put it on your calendar, maybe a little uh, reminder. We've got a really good uh, hangout in store for you today. We did this uh, last week with uh, two other uh, traders. Uh, so, uh, and that went extremely well. So we thought we would do it again. And uh, we've invited back a couple uh, more PTU and Trend Jumper traders. Troy's going to be interviewing them. They're going to talk about their experiences, the markets, where they started, what they're currently involved in. Uh, it's the type of thing where I think uh, those of you uh, listening to this live, by all means, take advantage of the uh, question and answers and uh, shoot some questions through. I'll uh, interrupt periodically uh, the interview, and we can uh, ask those questions directly of Troy or both of the guests, uh, who I'm going to let Troy introduce in more detail here uh, in a moment. So definitely take advantage of that. You just type it into the panel and I'll see that uh, and we'll go ahead and uh, ask the questions of, of the guests. And uh, I'm real curious to hear what they're trading, kind of what their path has been, uh, what they're looking to do here going forward. And I think, you know, you always hear it from us and we give you a lot of guidance on the type of markets and where you should all be. Uh, but I think it's really tremendously valuable to also hear it from other students as well, going through the same process that uh, all of you are. Uh, and kind of see the path that they took, you know, whether the obstacles they ran into, the things that they're really succeeding at, any of the challenges that they had. So I think you'll get a lot from that as well. So uh, that's going to be the main plan for today. Uh, I'll come in uh, towards the end. We'll just do a wrap up uh, like we always do. We'll talk a little bit about uh, trades and performance on the week uh, and what to expect next week and uh, and that'll be our hangout session so Troy I think uh, let's go ahead and jump in I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to you great thank you Mark and I'm really happy I'm excited today to be actually joined by uh, two members that I've, I've had the opportunity of getting to know better uh, Matt Runkle who uh, is a newer member I believe Matt you could tell us when you join in, in a few moments but Matt and I started corresponding not too long ago he's been really active in um, getting up and running with Trend Jumper and he's been sending me a lot of great questions and I know that he's uh, laying the foundation in the proper way and I'm it's just it's really great to 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 meet him and, and see him going down the pathway in um, you know following all the steps properly so I'm, I'm really curious and, he, and his take on the markets uh, are pretty interesting and then also John Huckle who many of you may know by now but if not um, John is uh, we, we go back quite a bit I had the pleasure of meeting him at a live PTU uh, uh, road show but prior to that he's been in and out of the trade rooms very active in the SST room in fact John um, actually came up with a unique innovation that ended up becoming the mainstay trade plan that's still being used today with crude oil. Uh, he added a little idea to SST and the results have been really great and, and some of the members have taken that even further now and used the same trade plan on other markets and having really great success with that as well. And then John also was a member of our first mastermind and uh, we're gonna hear how that's been going for him. He's um, getting ready really close to actually getting funded to trade other people's money so really excited to have John so uh, let me just jump right in Matt I'll start with you uh, if you want to unmute your mic and maybe you could just tell us a little bit about where you're from where you live and what you did before you got into trading sure um, well, first of all my my path to trading has been a, a tad bizarre I suppose um, but uh, as far as where I'm from, where I live, uh, rural Midwest my whole life. I'm in southern Wisconsin right now. Um, fresh six inches of snow out there as I'm staring at more coming down right now. Um, but as far as the path into trading, like I said, a little bizarre, I suppose. My, my background has not a thing to do with, with finance or, or the markets initially. My, my whole time in college, for example, I, I was an art student. and. Uh, Right towards, uh, but I didn't, my degree, my degree ended up being in communications while I was working at the, at the TV station on, on campus. Um, 
And uh, towards the end of end of my my last semester, I I got a call as I was trying to find some some real work to uh, to pay the bills. Uh, I got a call from a financial services company, basically looking for any warm body to fill some sales positions for them. And uh, you know, I, I thought though I thought though it was one of the neatest things I'd ever heard. I, I was not the least bit familiar with it. Um, as far as their total package of personal financial planning. And um, I just love the idea of it. So I got involved with that. I made no money um, from the sales side. I'm, I, I guess I'm no born salesman, but uh, I, um, I ended up actually in, in mortgage lending and real estate and, and still there to, to, to this day. And I, I'd sort of fallen into trading by accident, kind of stumbled across um, some some videos online and uh, my introduction was was the whole penny stock world and the thing that I thought was interesting about that is that up until that point even with that little bit of financial planning background I always thought of investment quote unquote in, in more conventional terms which is to say I never thought it went much beyond studying PE ratios and a, and a company's debt to earnings and all of that sort of thing. I didn't realize that there was any other way to do it. I didn't realize there were other niches that, that technical analysis was a thing that even existed. Um, and uh, so I, I started that way. I, I started day trading penny stocks at the open and uh, I actually made money doing it, which surprised me more every day that I, that I made money. And I thought that, um, I thought my initial plan, I figured the longer I kept going with it and, and as I kept making money that I'd gain confidence in it and I would be able to scale up my positions and grow my account faster. But the thing is every day that went by, even as I was making money, I didn't feel one day more confident, one day closer to uh, a growing account. I felt like it was just one more day that I dodged the bullet um, because I didn't have much of a plan. You know, I had I, I had uh, some some real time scanners set up, and I would I would sit there, uh, you know, 15 minutes before waiting for things to get going, and then as the bell rang and things started to hit my scanners, uh, you know, I'd pull up a chart here or there, the ones that seemed most most promising. I look at the chart and I just make an on the spot gut reaction call: Am I going to go with this or not? I'd go until I found one, and I and I buy in on something, and uh, and I'd sit there and hope for the best. Um, so basically, you're trading with no plan at first, and you're just kind of winging it, and you know, maybe yeah. it would work, maybe it wouldn't, and yeah, I'm was, assuming, was, I'm assuming that's what kind of got you thinking about maybe needing to figure out some sort of structure, some absolutely. something else to, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was it was white knuckle, edge of the seat trading. <laughs> yeah, um, no which, way to survive. Which, no, which, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't fit my personality really it's not how I wanted to trade um, it was the only thing I really knew about at the time and I um, but anyhow you're, you're exactly right I, I saw that and like I said every day I felt like I just uh, I, I dodged the bullet so I just I, I put the brakes on it and I said I gotta do something better than this and I got, I got involved uh, with an educational program which at that point there was you know a lot of basic stuff I'd already covered um, but it, it, it reinforced it and it started to get some things in my head about the, the better way to do it. Ended up with a with a lengthy study in Elliott Wave at the end of the whole thing. The guy who was my mentor was a big Elliott Wave trader. And so you had a mentor had, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And actually it was the setup was such that I had I had a primary mentor who I who I work with weekly and um, also at any time I, I could call in and set up an appointment with any of their other individuals so you know it was good I had access to a, to a whole lot of different people and um, you know that started to put the idea in my head of like I said the, the better way to do it but the thing that um, you know the thing that it, that attracted me here and you'd mentioned that I'm a relatively new trend jumper member I think it's been a, a month maybe um, maybe right about 30 days exactly uh, the thing that I really liked so much about um, net picks and your your videos in particular is that it um, I don't know it strikes me as, as a complete proper professional way to approach things even even when I was doing the 
you know, with, with connecting the two worlds, the tools and the business side of it, the management side of it, um, with strategies like Trend Jumper available in the SST and all the other ones that you have available, that I always thought was lacking from even the more um, complete education that, that I participated in is that they'll, they'll teach you the business side and, and they'll teach you all the educational tidbits, but you're still kind of left on your own to put the pieces together. And I have been for most of my time in trading now, and I haven't been doing it on my own for all that long of a few years, I suppose. Um, I am a, I'm a habitual strategy writer, um, half addicted to it, I suppose. And, uh, you know, I've already taken some of the insight that I've gained from the trend jumper and gone back to my own strategies and added, um, added some elements that have, that have improved those. And I'm, I'm totally infatuated with the UTA. Um, <laughs> I, I love a good spreadsheet anyway, but, uh, you know, I, I bought the full version and, uh, man, that's the best money I have ever spent because not only, that a lot. you know, not only, because you can, you can put the trades in there and you see the numbers and you can slice and dice it any any sort of way you want. But I love the thing that sold me was the expectation graph. I, I'd never come across that before in all my education and reading. I'd, I'd never come across that formula and that method for predicting how robust your system is and whether or not it has a chance to, to last over time. And uh, of all the strategies I've written in all my own trading, I've... I, tended in the past to sort of waffle back and forth across both sides and break even. And I think the reason, the insight that I got from that expectation number is that it, you know, it shows you the two sides of the coin, uh, that win-loss ratio versus average dollars won to loss and how that Im impacts your, your potential for long-term robustness in the system. And when you can focus in on that, when you're, you're writing a strategy, you're tweaking your rules, um, if you don't have some concept of what is really going to make this better over time, um, you know, you're just kind of playing with the toys in the box out there without a, a clear direction. You know, I, I sort of thought of it as being like sitting around tinkering, trying to build the better mouse trap without ever really stopping to think how it is that you actually catch mice. You know, and it, you, let me stop you right there for a second because you, you hit upon some good points. But I want to bring I want to bring John into the conversation too. He's had a lot of experience with the UTA as well, and um, I want to come back to what you're doing with it and what markets you're actually uh, trading because I think it's uh, I think a lot of listeners are going to find uh, it, it's interesting what you what your chosen markets are. But John, why don't you jump in and say hello and uh, let us know where you're from and a little bit of your background. Um, okay, is it, you hear me okay there, TJ? You sound great. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm uh, from Canada. I live in Calgary or Western Canada, so I'm in the snow like you are, Matt. Um, I, by trade, I've actually been in a couple of careers. I started in banking management, in administration management for five years, which to me was like getting a Bachelor of Commerce degree out of school, and then I'm by trade an airline pilot. So a typical month for me is 40 to 50,000 miles of traveling between North America and Asia primarily. And uh, I've always had an interest in the financial markets and numbers have has always been my strong point names and that is uh, on the other side of the equation is my weak point. So anyways, um, I've dabbled in the market. Uh, I started back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I, st I basically started out, I think everybody maybe have heard of the Ken Roberts, the one, two, three tops <laughs> and bottom systems. That's where I started. Uh, long story short, I dabbled with futures trading and it has always been an interest of mine. Um, I probably made most mistakes known to mankind in trading in this process and I would think now it would have been four or five years ago where I come across the NetPix uh, uh, organization and I've been a member uh, uh, through some of the various trading systems and really it's only been in the last since SST came out I think was it almost two years ago now TJ? More than that actually almost three Let's see, did we lose John? Might have lost John. We give John a chance to come back. Um, Matt, hopefully John is, is going to log back in here. Everyone can hear me, Mark? Give me the thumbs up. Yeah, Troy, you, you came through fine. I just, yeah, I heard the uh, same thing. His uh, mic, it looks like his video went out, so I'm sure he'll okay. just need to get back in. 
Okay, Matt, let's um. I want to hear a little bit more about this, how you're using the expectation table, but let's talk a little bit first about what markets you're actually trading, like right now with Trend Jumper and some of the other stuff you're 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 working on. Sure. Well, with Trend Jumper, I'm I'm still in the back test phase. I mean, I've made some simulated trades. I haven't gotten to that point yet where I'm, you know, making my 25 perfect executions before going live with it. I'm 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 an obsessive back tester. Um, so I, I've, I'm all in on what, what you say about 100, 200, 300 plus trades. I mean, I'll probably do two or three times that. Um, but I, I, have, I, I have made a couple along the way when I'm standing in front of the chart and say, well, here's a setup. Let's take one. And, uh, you know, so in the, in the couple of trend jumper trades I have taken in the process, I, I don't think I've lost one yet. I think it was, I don't know, maybe 350 bucks in the couple that I just decided to, hey, let's go ahead and grab one. Um, otherwise, the, the markets that I've spent the most time on, I, I had mentioned the, the Elliott Wave study I did back in my mentoring program. Um, I really learned that on the sugar market. And, um, and to this day, my, one of my biggest um, single winning trades was an Elliott Wave trade on the sugar market. It's not a process I trade anymore just because the, the risk is too large. Um, even on that, even on that big, that big winner, I had to sweat a couple of nights before it went the right way. You know, you kind of have to put your stop way back there past the, the peak of the last wave and, and hold on and hope you get So we're not right. talking about day trading here. You're actually holding those positions overnight. Well, back then I was. Back right. then I was, which, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's sort of a weird thing. You know, it's, I mentioned that my background, um, my, my background in, in college was as an artist, and that's still the other half of my life. Um, it's still the other half of my life, and and I have through the whole process of trading and, and learning to trade, I've been constantly surprised at how much correlation I've seen between the two universes of of being an artist and being a trader. Which nobody I talk to, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to anybody else. But you know, it all comes down to the fact that to be either first and foremost, I think you absolutely have to know yourself before you can have any kind of success. Um, you know, maybe that's a little more, well, to any trader, I suppose you understand how it fits on the trading side. Um, to the average person, I suppose maybe they, they get that from, from the art side to have some sort of, some sort of personal voice, a thing to say beyond just, um, executing techniques and so forth. But in trading, I think it's exactly the same way because if you don't know how the inside of your own head works, um, what, uh, what sort of expectations you have, what sort of risk you can live with. Um, you can't, can you still hear me, TJ? My yeah, videos. you're good. Okay. You're good. good. I had some crazy video flashes on my end here. Um, anyhow, it, it said, if you don't know, if you don't know what sort of risk you're going to be willing to take, there's an infinite number of ways to trade and, and you can be successful with very many of them. And you listen to, uh, you listen to all kinds of people and, you don't know what to think. You try this thing, and you you spend some money on, it and then you lose some money with it, and, and it never it, it never fits you. So that that I think is first and foremost the thing that a person needs to understand, and that's and that you mentioned the the longer term trades. I did that. I started as I mentioned with the with the penny stock trades at, at the open, maybe fifteen minutes tops, and. and um, I guess I came to realize that my comfort zone is somewhere in the middle. I hate the white knuckle trading. But I don't want to have to sit around for days and days. You know, I don't want to spend a week before a trade goes the right way. And that's and that's one thing that that I really like about about the trend jumper system and what's what's ultimately attracted me here and why why I'm here. It's it's I think it's the right balance. It can be a really quick trade, um, or if you've got a trailer that hangs on for a while, you know, you can stay in it and. Um, and make that bigger profit, but uh, ultimately you've got a foundation, and that's that's the thing I personally needed, um, as opposed to the just the gut call, buy the buy the stock at the open. Um, that, you know, it, that's it was a cool. Good fit for me. Yeah, great, and I think you're hitting on some real key issues. Uh, I think knowing yourself, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. If you know, you you may not know how actually you're going to react until you're in a live trade and you're experiencing. Uh, that, that the trade's not going your way and, and all of a sudden you become human and you try to stop yourself from, from hurting 
or whatever you could do to stop the pain. I think that's how I always look at it. And so you, you know, if you don't know yourself and you haven't learned that part of yourself, you're definitely in. You're in for an awakening as a trader because you're definitely going to learn that. Absolutely. Better off doing it uh, probably in a practice account. I think I see that John came back on. So let's see if uh, <laughs> Earth to John, <laughs> you there? Uh Yes, uh, sorry about that. I'm in a hotel room and my 24-hour plan just came up for renewal. So that's what happened. <laughs> I've been there, done that. All right, so... so <laughs> send, us, send us the bill on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, um, John, I want to I wanna jump in to kind of where, where you came from. I mean, you know, speed forward up to current times. I know I, I was, as I was mentioning, you, you've been in a lot of the trade rooms that I've hosted over the last few years and you're pretty influential in, in the last room, the SST room, and they adopted one of your innovations uh, from the SST. But you actually came upon that from the mastermind program that we that we did a while back. Uh, that's correct. Uh, and and as uh, as you're aware, uh, TJ, the mastermind program was really took my trading to the next level. That process involved uh, up to that point, I'd really just as the different systems or products come out, I would just simply take and run with them. What I did in Mastermind was to go through the UTA using the UTA, as Matt has mentioned, uh, back test, own, uh, take ownership of the trading plan, develop the trading plan, and that process in the case of crude oil is what happened uh, for me uh, in uh, being able to come up with the EMA and uh, the different targets that are now being used in the room. I really credit back testing and in the cases I have mentioned to you in the past is I will typically go through the back testing process over a period of time six to eight times as I'm looking at strategies and so forth so I was fortunate last year to have some extra time off work to be able to do that so I would say in the past uh, 12 months I've probably put in three to four hundred hours of work of back testing and analysis uh, to get my trade plan where it is today and that's about to pay off big time for you. Um, I, I I know that you've been through this process. I mean, I'm I'm like you. I've done it a lot myself, as you know. I uh, wouldn't have ever been able to come up with an SST or Trend Jumper if it wasn't for the UTA and all the time that I invested in it. But it was the actual criteria of the prop firm that uh, uh, the mastermind members were trying to get uh, you know set up to to actually get funded by and trade someone else's money and the, the strict criteria that they imposed upon each trader that caused you to actually go back to the drawing board over and over again to kind of you know tighten the bolts and get get it to where you you actually could have a trade plan that would fit within that strict criteria am I correct? That's correct I, I mean just to give uh, other members a, a, a idea in the in the case to become a funded trader I'm attempting under their what they call a hundred thousand dollar account I must make um, in 20 trading days you must make ten thousand dollars you cannot lose more than two thousand dollars in any given day and three thousand cumulatively over a period of that uh, 20 days uh, so that uh, and in addition there's some other caveats your time and trades must be at least 50% profitable and more profitable than loss in time and so forth. So that criteria is very difficult, but having said that, it is achievable and that's what's really made me fine tune uh, taking, an, uh, and I use, as you're aware, the uh, Trend Jumper program, but I have a hybrid program. I take the jump trades as the CAN program, but I have a hybrid crossover system that I use and an additional couple filters to help me keep me out of the chop and reduce the losses. It's increased the by doing that has increased my performance over the what I call the generic uh, plan by about uh, 10%. Which is sufficient enough to kind of keep you going with the prop firm and now you're really close to actually hitting that goal of uh, that the big the big bell of success where you're close to getting funded now. Yeah. And that's yeah and I've spent a lot of time with um, obviously crude oil in this process I'm looking forward to once I am a funded trader then to take my trade hybrid trend jumper trade plan and apply it to other markets and see how it performs. That'll be a, to me a real test is to see going forward or some of the filters I use, will they be able to be used universally or not? That's a question I'm looking forward to uh, back testing in the future. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you won't know until you try, but I do know that the SST uh, plan that you put forth is still being used 
in that SST trade room and that a number of traders are using the same idea on different markets and having success with that too. So hopefully, hopefully you'll get the same sort of success and robustness with uh, what you're doing with crude. But even if it only works on crude, I mean, so far so good. And, and so. it is. I mean, this this whole process of the mastermind is where well, my ultimate goal is to go from a part-time trader to a full-time trader, and uh, I see this very much as a uh, critical path item in my stepping stone towards that goal. Has uh, been trend jumper, UTA, and SST. These products alone uh, themselves uh, have the uh, uh, are, are giving me that springboard. And as I mentioned, or you mentioned in the intro, that I did attend the PTU. Uh, presentation here a while back in Los Angeles and and uh, as I mentioned to you at that time I uh, you know it was that product to me is 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 given the people the similar opportunity albeit in a more simplified form to from the mastermind to have a complete program to work with and uh, you know I only wish that product would have been available several years ago to have saved me some pain in my my account so boy Mark how often do we hear that uh from traders. Maybe I should stop and see if you have any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Troy, it's been a, a quiet audience. I guess they're just uh, riveted so far, but I, I would just uh, repeat, uh, you know, by all means, uh, send through your questions uh, for Troy or the, uh, to the traders today, and I'll, uh, I'll interrupt when they come through. Sounds good. Matt, um, let's jump over to, I, I'm, I'm curious about sugar because it's a market that I've taken an interest in, and I've looked at it a bit here and there with Trend Jumper, and I could see there's definitely tradable movement on the, on that market um, but I'm just I'm curious if you've given it a close look with trend jumper you know it I haven't um, I haven't with trend jumper I guess I now that I think about it I haven't had a trade station account up until I uh, became a trade station member and uh, I don't know I suppose they offer delayed data on that market don't they I'm, I, I guess sure. I'm not sure I all I know is it's not part of the regular regular package the the $85 fee a month if you want to have the live feed on it, I believe. So I haven't spent um, any time with it on Trend Jumper. I mean, previously, the reason the reason I liked it so much um, in the past or when I was studying Elliott Wave is it seemed to be uh, a big trend-friendly market, which would obviously make it uh, a Trend Jumper-friendly market. And, um, you know, most any kind of system that, that uh, is, is built around writing trends but uh, you know I guess I can't give you real insiders insight into it and it's been maybe a year since I have spent a whole lot of time with it but that was the thing I liked so much about it is that it uh, you know every market's gonna chop at times but uh, it, it was a market that that at least then really really liked some big moves um, Fred I can't give you a whole lot of current detail on it but. I may have to go in and actually take a closer look myself, but before we actually started a few minutes, you know, a few minutes before, you also mentioned uh, your interest in wheat futures. That's one of my personal favorites, too. I'm trading it every day. In fact, uh, it was an amazing week. We had some huge trades and just, you know, consecutive winning sessions back to back to back to back. It's just, wheat's just phenomenal. Have you taken a good look at wheat with Trend Jumper? I, um... Uh... You know, I'd actually, yes, I started my, my UTA backtesting, I started on wheat, and I, um, I I keep bouncing around between between all sorts of ideas, so I've got, I, I literally have about 12 different UTA spreadsheets going right now that I keep <laughs> bouncing around between all of them, and I, I see everybody's laughing, so I think we all, we all understand that uh, experience. Well, I yeah, I would just say be careful because it's a slippery slope that I find with a lot of even experienced traders that they, they have a hard time just committing. And so they find I find that they kind of bounce around from market to market to market to market and never really just put their anchor down and go for it. Like John, you know, he went back to the same market and the same data redoing his back test until he finally got it to where it was perfect like six times the same hundreds of trades over and over and over versus you know trying to look at too much and I'm not saying that's what you're doing but I want to put that out as a caution just in general to the general audience because it's just something we encounter a lot and so I don't know. Yeah, absolutely I, I, I couldn't agree more when I say I've got 12 going I don't mean I've got 12 different markets I don't mean I had a bad day on the spreadsheet so now I'm you know, good. not not <laughs> into good. weed anymore. I just mean I've, you know, I've right. I've tried uh, 
I, I've started one with the with the, your your tick chart recommendations, and you mentioned the momentum bar. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually spent most of my time with a standard range bar. And uh, oh. I guess I guess let let me throw this out to you as a question. This might be a good discussion. I've um, in my back testing uh, with the momentum bar, I ended up going back to the standard range bar just because I found that in particularly in choppy periods, the momentum bar having that little momentum gap from bar close to next open, I, I found that it was that it was triggering a lot of jump trades that I didn't necessarily want. Right? I mean, obviously, you, you know, you get some entry sometimes you, you don't want, but um, I don't know. It, it seemed to make it the signals a little more noisy in the choppy periods, having the the momentum gap from candle to candle. I'm curious what your take might be on that, and that's why I like the range bars. I thought it was on the whole a little more even and level-headed. You know, it's an interesting question. I haven't taken a close look and compared the two. I know that with uh, the momentum bars are working great with heating oil and unleaded. Those are the two markets I've really just kind of hunkered down with with the. Uh, momentum bars and I love the results that we're getting on a day-to-day -day basis and for me the 200 tick has just been I can't get away from that with wheat you know I just I kinda of picked it out pull it out of thin air and put it on a chart looked at it liked what I saw and I'm I'm real simple if it ain't broke don't fix it if I see it right away I like what it, it's doing I'm there and so I just stuck with it and and to this day it just keeps plowing forward so for me, it's the 200 tick chart with wheat, and I I know I I've liked what I saw with the five tick rain, uh, momentum bar, and I know that continues to work with SST. It's like one of it's just been this amazing plan for over two years now, um, three years, but I don't know. I can't tell you. Yeah, let, let me jump in real quick, Troy, on that. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you, like on on PTU two, I looked at it. Uh, in a lot of detail, uh, just like you're mentioning, you know, because they're definitely different charts, right? They, they feel like they're the same because they're equal lengths, uh, and you set it at range in TradeStation, or you set it at momentum. For those people listening, uh, if you're on NinjaTrader, you, you, the momentum is the same as uh, range uh, on uh, trade or on NinjaTrader is the same as momentum in TradeStation. And what I kind of found is you get very different performance. So I'm not surprised that that's something that you uh, that you picked up. On Matt, because you're right. It's you. You think uh, you you should get something very similar, and it can be dramatically different to the point where I could have a plan that's profitable, switch it over to range, for instance, and it may actually uh, lose money. Uh, and the other thing I found it was definitely much more market dependent. Originally, when I started, I was going with range as well on TradeStation, but I actually found over time that there was uh, more consistent performance on momentum. However, with Trend Jumper, it's completely different, like you say, because you have a different type of rule set going on where we're just looking at price movement and price action. You've got a situation where that little gap can potentially cause a trade or cause a setup. So one thing that we try to do, or I like to do a lot, is use some of the trade assist automation, same exact settings over a long stretch of time, and just literally run you know, a test comparing the two. Uh, and it's really fascinating sometimes the the length of the difference or how, how much of a difference you get. So definitely something that I've seen. It only impacts you if you're on TradeStation. If you're on Ninja, you know, you have one one choice uh, for uh, for range bars. Yeah, that's interesting. I should probably look at range. So so that's what you're preferring, actually, on wheat then, huh, Matt? Is it a five-tick range? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I like so much about the, the range bars um, is is the extra control it gives you over the risk reward, um, and I don't know that that's an interesting. I'm sure there's all kinds of schools of thought on it. I mean, the interesting thing about the tick chart and the way the trend jumper targets are set is that if you're trading on a tick chart, of course it's going to adjust dynamically to whatever the order flow is at that moment. How big is that 200 tick bar? With you know where it carries the implication that if you've got a large tick bar and you get your larger targets, well, it's making the assumption that uh, at this moment, the uh, the order flow is such that it can carry you to that higher price. Um, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. And But I found, I don't I don't know, this is, I guess this goes back to knowing the inside of your own head, that uh, I prefer something where I can control it a little bit more, where I know every single bar, it's going to be the same distance to this target, the same distance to that target. My stop is always going to be the same. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I guess it's a different school of thought. But, yeah, that's it's been the standard range bar that I've been looking at. And I've actually, 
I've also been been testing the ES with it as well because the ES is another one that, that you know I as many many people have spent a lot of time with um, run some automated ideas on that in in, in the recent past and. Um, I ultimately gave up my automated ideas on it because I was having some fill issues just because there was too many people standing in line. You know, but but the thing that's the thing that's interesting, and the reason I've gone back to testing it with, with trend jumper and some of my other ideas that I've added some trend jumper type rules to mm -hmm. is simply because from from my experience, and I, I guess I'm curious what, what you might think about this this Troy and John too, having done so much back testing with the UTA. I won't consider my target hit unless it has traded through, um, regardless of the market, whether I'm testing wheat or, or any you know fill friendly market like crude or anything. Um, I just don't want to rely on my successful back test results needing to get filled when my target is ticked but not traded through, because that was the problem I had on the ES. Is that you know I had a a half brilliant idea except that. You know, I I couldn't get the fill unless it was traded through. So, well, that's one of the natures of the ES is one of the additional hurdles and challenges. It makes it uh, more difficult to trade. I I think personally, um, but I, I know I have my take on that question. How about you, John? Uh, in the case of crude oil, I, what I found is, and that goes back to when we were using the you know the second versus the third target. If there's momentum, it more times than not will carry through the target. I am cognizant of it that I back test the same way. It it must go at least one tick through the target to consider it as a as a full winner, uh, just to allow for that momentum and that uh, slippage. I, I'm different from you, Matt, in that I enjoy the tick bars because I my trading plan. Uh, I've developed uh, what I call a two-part strategy. One is a scalp trade where I will I have a different set of rules for any entry bar that's up to seven seven ticks and then I call it a normal trade from eight ticks or larger. So I'm using a bit more of a di dynamic approach that way. And uh, ironically, the small scalp trades when the market is choppy uh, will account somewhere in some days upwards of 50% of the net return that the market will give me by using those smaller trades. So I'm more uh, you know, more focused on the dynamics with the tick trade versus having the same, you know, using the momentum bars or something where you have the same targets and the same stops and and that. And this worked well for me in the, in the 377 tick on the on the crude oil plan. Yeah, that yeah, that's interesting. You know, each chart has its strengths and and weaknesses and advantages and disadvantages, and it's just a matter of being able to trade within the, you know the characteristics of the chart. I, it took me a while to get used to range bars too because you know it, you, you have to anticipate when that bar is going to close and where your entry is going to be quite often. With trend jumper you gotta you know if you wait until after the bar closes you might miss your entry. So you know once you figure that part of it out you can get your entries in and you just gotta be really proactive and make sure you cancel and always be ready to get those entries in. Whereas with tick chart, a tick bar you can see that bar counting down you know and so to me that that was a big a big advantage I, I mean I can see strengths and weaknesses on both I, I like them both I think there's a whole lot of room to explore more more possibilities uh, we barely scratched the surface um, I know trend jumper is so versatile it's so easy really don't change much on it you know you just plug it and play having a lot of great effect and uh, great Great results with the end of day charts too. I mean, that's a time-based chart if you think about it, and it's it's been awesome on forex. Um, I, I don't want to go over. We've got a few more minutes left, and I do want to find out a couple things specifically. Uh, you know, Matt and John, if you can keep your answers brief, that'd be great. But I I kind of want to hear what obstacles you're currently facing, and what where you see your next step is as far as what you're going to do next with your trading, Matt. Let's start with you. Okay. Well, the um, the hurdle I, I would say is is what I mentioned before, where I've you know I spent a whole lot of time with with my own strategies and, and trading different ways, trying to find what fits, and I've I've always sort of waffled back and forth across break even, um, and and that. Uh, and that goes back to what I was saying about the expectation table in the UTA, where previously I think I was just, you know, pulling strings here and pulling strings there, but not necessarily to any real purpose. Whereas now understanding, having the expectation table to look at and understanding how that formula works such that you can, you can realize that robustness of a system over time is built from 
winning percentage in combination with average dollars won to lost. It gives you some purpose in, in building the strategy in the first place and tweaking it and refining the rules because without that kind of focus, if you take this indicator away or add it or adjust the settings, add this rule or that, I don't know, you're just kind of playing, hoping it's going to work. But with that focus from from the expectation table, you can say, okay, is, is this change that I'm going to make, is it going to increase my winning percentage uh, enough such that if I'm taking a, a little bit of a reduction in average dollars won to loss, maybe it's a more conservative target or something like that, so it's upping your win percentage. Well, does it, does it all come out in the wash? Does it break even or is it a meaningful change? And vice versa, if I'm going to hang on, if I'm going to hang on for bigger winners, um, is it going to lower my, my winning percentage to the extent that it, it doesn't matter? So I think that's been my biggest hurdle over time, and I think that's, uh, that's one thing that's been half epiphany to me at least. So, you know, my step forward from here is, is to, you know, sort of embrace that insight and again, continue my trend jumper back test, and I, I know I'm going to spend time with my own strategies because, like I said, I'm, I'm a habitual fiddler with those things. But uh, I also see the the trend jumper in its in its risk management and in its targeting system as being a tremendous insight that I was missing before. Because um, before I always trying to find modified, you know, stop reverse type systems, and it just never worked. Um, so that that targeting and risk management philosophy has been great, and I think it's 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 the piece of the puzzle that, that my other strategies were missing. So That's great. Yeah, good. That's quite an epiphany. <laughs> I'm glad that it was helpful in that regard. Um, we got a couple minutes left here. Let me, let me just briefly go to John and uh, hear what's next for you, John, and what challenges are you currently faced with. We got about a minute to go here. Okay. Uh, just very shortly, uh, obviously being becoming funded through the, uh, through the organization in Chicago, is my first step with crude. Where I see my options going from here is that, as we know, crude takes a lot of focus. So the only other market I'm trading myself live right now is wheat under the trend jumper trade plan. Where I want to go, and I consider it an obstacle, I'm resisting going to Forex, but I think with the performance in Forex and the trading partner I work with has said, you've got to get into that end of the day with trend jumper Forex. That's where I'm headed, whether I like to or not. So uh, beyond that, and then <laughs> so that's where, where I'm headed. It's it's amount of time and day with my existing other trade or job that I do or career. Uh, it's hours of the day is my biggest hurdle is having the amount of hours of a day. I would like to full time trade, but I'm not there yet. So you got to walk before you run. Very good, um, Mark. Uh, before I let these gentlemen off the hook here, let me just go to you and see if there's any questions before we move over to the wrap up. No, Troy, we've, uh, <clears throat> we've clearly got a, a crowd that is uh, in an after-lunch coma at the moment. <laughs> I myself was in one. I actually ran down and had, if anybody knows Austin, Texas, we have uh, a place called Franklin Barbecue, and I had a lineup. You have to line up about an hour and a half in advance, so I'm, I'm barely making it through as well, but to me, this is interesting, <laughs> so it keeps me uh, up and alert, but uh, certainly if there's any questions, uh, I'll, uh, I'll go back. I'll, I'll check the chat here periodically, so uh, very quiet overall. Um, so no, that was great. Really appreciate that. Um, appreciate uh, uh, both uh, Matt and James, you know, uh, hanging out with us today. Uh, Matt and John, sorry. Uh, and I'll look and see if there's any more questions. I've got a couple things that we usually like to uh, go with, so I'm going to switch on the screen share real quick, and I'll wait for that to uh, come on. <clears throat> I'm, I think it's always a little bit behind on the channel. There it goes. I think it's starting to come up. So I like to show this every week when I can anyway. It's a bit of a report card. I like to keep tracking all the different markets and trade plans. Uh, in this case, this would be with PTU2. So this is going to be different than uh, Trend Jumper. You know, Trend Jumper is going to have different performance, obviously a different approach to the market. So, uh, you know, Troy can speak more to uh, what's happening uh, in, in that area. But this is also really good for me to sort of know what's happening in the various markets. Uh, this is always based upon, of course, one contract, uh, not based upon any trailing. This is also based upon 100% mechanical. Uh, so no benefit of training as far as key level adjustments, chart level adjustments. And then I just try to find trends in here, try to notice any market that is uh, mostly underperforming. Obviously, I love outperformance, but uh, I'm more interested in anything is starting to lag behind 
a little bit. Uh, clearly, you can see the you know the best performers and futures uh, this week were uh, silver, unleaded gas, soybeans, natural gas, uh, and the DAX. Um, what was interesting, what I've been finding interesting, is we have a crude breakout, uh, P2 breakout that's been doing extremely well. It you know was very good this week, the best week uh, since early January when it was 930 bucks for the week for a single contract. And then if we look at the pullback strategy, uh, which is the P2 two, uh, has not been faring well of late. And it's interesting trying to understand sometimes, like the guys were talking about, the different behaviors uh, in a market, and it's it's almost unusual to have that big of a disparity between them, but what this tells me a lot with crude, uh, and I don't know if John's finding this or, uh, as much or not, uh, is we're not getting quite those breakouts, pullbacks, breakouts, pullbacks, you know, those trending moves. Um, the reason the breakout strategy is working better is because it catches the move right away, but what this means down below when this is negative is we're probably not getting a sustained move to the upside or a sustained move to the downside on multiple sessions, uh, and that's what I've been seeing when I've observed uh, the chart. So crude is, you know, an all-time favorite, but it's interesting. I'm definitely getting underperformance here, and I guess I'm getting, oddly enough, outperformance uh, with a very similar system, just one that is going in a little bit sooner uh, overall. Uh, otherwise, everything pretty good, uh, as we can see. Uh, the Euro FX futures in the U.S. session kind of had its first negative week in about five weeks, uh, but for the most part, everything was positive. So I think, Troy, you were saying this too. You found in in Trend Jumper, this was a was a really good week. It was. Uh, there were some uh, challenges with crude oil, but just hunkering down and you know fighting your way through the session. Every session was positive, and today you kind of got paid for all that hard work because it was two quick trades and a nice seventy eight cent uh, net profit going into the weekend. It's always nice on on, on a Friday. It, it was nice. good, and and all the, and everything ended up. I mean, we we broke. Broke out to new all-time record profit levels with trend jumpers since I've been tracking on almost all the markets that, that I follow. So it was great. And then, of course, the Forex uh, end of day has just been outstanding as well. What have, what have you all been saying? This could be either to you, Troy, or to, uh, to John, just on the, uh, the trailing trades. Because, you know, PTU2, we do fixed targets, one contract. Uh, are you seeing the, uh, the trailers at this time? Is there enough volatility where that's – a big part of your profits, or are you seeing it more on the fixed targets? What are you guys seeing? You want to answer that first, John? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, as I mentioned earlier, where I'm using the uh, like a scalp trade format, I found oil since last summer. We're not getting the the runners or, or the breakouts that we've had it, you know, in the past. I'm using a, a four contract trade to go in. I have a you know at about ten to thirteen ticks, I take one contract off my fixed target. Um, uh, or the third dot, uh, take two off, and I trail the fourth one. So I'm only, what I'm seeing is that trailer is the exception, not the rule of seeing the majority of where the, uh, the uh, performance is coming from. So I and I guess in a nutshell, the fixed target right now seems to work the best for me on the uh, crude oil uh, trading. And, and yeah, and I would say that, you know, the trailers, it's, it's when you catch the big move, you don't get them as often. But when you do catch them, it does make a big difference. We had a 90 cent move last week. It was huge, made a big difference on the week, you know. And and then today also uh, there was it was kind of split. One trade the trailer outperformed, and uh, the second trade it didn't. So I mean I'm still thinking the trailer is adding a lot. When I look at my cumulative totals, um, just with the basic plan that I've been tracking all this time, the trailer has outperformed uh, by a third of uh, the fixed positions. Yeah, I guess what, what I've been seeing, and I guess to, to John's point, I think that's probably why I'm seeing the, uh, the breakout being much more successful because if we don't get the, the breakout, the pullback to moving averages, another breakout, uh, the P2-2 uh, relies on that, whereas the breakout doesn't. So I think we're probably seeing something very similar on that. I've noticed uh, when I'm testing things that the markets that, seem to do the best on trailing where you will occasionally attach or, or catch that amazing runner are things more like unleaded gas, um, looking through the list here, heating oil, um, what else, silver. Uh, I kind of find that those are the best markets for the consistent runners and things like natural gas and crude oil and the DAX, for instance, uh, seem to do best with a nice, you know, sizable uh, fixed target. But that's just something, you know, to Matt's point, you know, where if you're log these things, 
I ultimately trust the numbers because a lot of times I'm looking at four different ways I could potentially trade crude oil. In the end, to me, it's the numbers. You know, which one has the best numbers? Which one has proven itself uh, over time? And that's that's the way that I go. I try to not have too much bias on insisting like that the trailer works or doesn't work. Or the same with range bar and momentum. You know, for me, I'm sure you guys are similar. Whatever's going to make me the most money is is it. I don't really have any loyalty uh, beyond that. So, you know, whatever I'm most comfortable with uh, and whatever is going to obviously provide the most consistency uh, overall is kind of key. Uh, the other thing we usually talk about a little bit here before we wrap up is the uh, economic calendar. And next week in particular, there are some things you need to be aware of. Uh, and this seems logical enough. Everybody should check the calendar. But I think we've all told stories before when we've all forgotten to check uh, the reports that are coming out and uh, and it's uh, ended up backfiring on us. So just be aware on Tuesday and Wednesday, 10 o'clock a.m. New York time, you have uh, the Bernanke testifying. Uh, I think one is before uh, the House and one's before the Senate, if I remember correctly. It's always prepared uh, statements in the beginning and then tends to be Q&A. So the first day on Tuesday is a little bit more of the wild card because typically uh, my understanding is a lot of times the uh, statement's repeated on Wednesday, but the Q&A can be a wild card. A lot of people step aside and they don't trade uh, Bernanke. Uh, some people only trade after. Uh, Troy, what's kind of your approach been on, on, this, uh, on this session or those two sessions? You know, I've taken a cautious slant where I just try to trade less. You know, if I'm used to power of quitting two, I try to get power of quitting one maybe and 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 uh, maybe quit real, really soon. But I also wanted to see how the market is handling, you know, what it's just like. I, what I've found mostly is that when I try to second guess and change the trade plan, uh, usually I find the trade plan just did the best. And by just doing nothing tends to be the best thing. But I do, I mean, my own trade plans are pretty conservative anyway because I only do power of quitting one on two markets right now. Sure. John, do you do anything different uh, on crude? Since I know you get an hour jump start on those uh, 10 o'clockers. Um, yeah, basically on uh, what I look at uh, for those next two days, I, I'm like Troy, I, I tend to be a little more conservative, so I may take uh, the first uh, trade. I start at 8.30 Eastern time and I trade two and a half hours a day, so I will reduce the trading hours on those days uh, for uh, with him speaking. As Troy says, it, it's the uh, the rooster in the hen house syndrome, and uh, I just st I prefer to stay away from it. And and uh, you know uh, if there's a bunch of winners, that's so say la vie. I just hate getting chopped around, and when you've got a wild card going on in the market. Yeah, a lot of times I end up regretting it when I force it a little bit. How about for you, Matt? Have you looked at like with the UTA and the spreadsheet? Do you try to look at uh, time at all? Like, if, what if I blocked out from you know 9:58 to 10:02 or something like that? I have, I have, and I and I started um, particularly since I um, was looking at the ES as well. Um, just log 24 hours a day, uh, and just to see, you know, maybe there's some overnight hours that that are good because uh, TJ hit uh, hit on a good point earlier. One of the difficulties with range bars is you do have to anticipate your entry because that next bar can be gone before. Um, before you know it, you, you missed your entry and you're never getting back in. And what I found after logging a, a bunch of 24-hour days is that the primary trading hours are really best. Um, and I suppose it, it stands to reason. I mean, you're going to get uh, you're going to get chopped around probably in most of the overnights. I mean, every now and then, um, you know, maybe something goes in a straight line, but. Um, but but other than that, yeah. I mean, as far as that goes, you know, I think. It was an important discussion earlier too, the the matter of the trailer versus the fixed position. And I found, uh, I found from my back testing what what TJ says to be absolutely true that the that the trailer most of the time for me. And I went back to August, I think it was when I started my back tests on on wheat, um, and it was definitely a little, a little choppy then in places that the the trailer would get taken off a lot of times with just a one tick money management win. But the thing is, to go back to the two sides of the expectation equation, um, if you've got your win percentage built out of only fixed positions and only one tick or, or fixed target winners and only one tick money management winners uh, without the big trailers, even just every now and then, you're going to end up with a relatively low dollars one to dollars loss ratio because your losers, you know, it depends how you manage those. If you're hanging on for the full stop all the time, every loss is a max loss. 
and that's going to that's going to kill you when you have every loss is a max loss in combination with fixed target winners being pulled down on average by one tick money management winners and that's where in, in my modifications of the, the trend jumper rule variations that's where I've started to employ um, well the trailer anyway is a standard part but also the the jump line trailer on the stop after hitting a certain level because that does two things one your trailer is in place to give you the big winner to pull your average dollars one up but also trailing the jump line on a stop cuts your risk so that every loss isn't a max loss and ultimately that puts that average dollars one to loss side of the coin in your favor uh, and I think it's absolutely important to have both of those at least my back testing says that it's, that it's a great advantage yeah, what's what's interesting about that is, um, you know, I've I've definitely uh, seen numbers like that, and uh, many times it's the, the question is, well, sh if I'm going to trade two contracts, then I really should just trade both on the trailer. And it seems on a spreadsheet, and I guess very academically, the correct answer because I'll see a lot of times fixed and trail will be less than if I just traded two, maybe on a market that breaks out a lot uh, as a trailer. But then there's this reality that when you're actually trading real with real money on the line, psychologically that is so difficult to have trades that are profitable and hitting what should have been a theoretical target to end up going out at that one tick or a loss or whatever the case may be, uh, that as much as I agree with that and I agree with the numbers, I kind of find that the trading, the typical trader can't trade that way, can't just trade uh, with the trailers, even if in the end, the numbers uh, prove to be better. So that's why normally we'll, if nothing else, try to split it and say, you know, fixed and trail. And actually start with fixed just to build that confidence up because it hurts a lot when you have trades going to what should be a target and you're ending up, you know, taking a break even or, or a tick gain or whatever the case may be, waiting on those big breakouts, which will happen like uh, this week on uh, Wednesday in crude, or was it Thursday? I can't remember, um, where we had the inventory report came out. And for the first time in a long time, there was a big move. And it was very sustainable to the downside. It was a huge trailer if you were in it. Um, and that's great, but you would have probably been waiting a month for that move uh, on you know, that inventory session. But in the end, when you look at a spreadsheet, yeah, it's real easy to look at and say, yeah, that's, that's the better of the two. So it's, it's definitely a struggle, and it's definitely something that people have to kind of you know, uh, deal with um, you know, as they look at everything overall. Well, let me go ahead and wrap up real fast because I know we're just about out of time. Just a quick reminder uh, at premiertraderuniversity.com, if you just go to... Uh, the free lessons and free webinars. We have a webinar on Tuesday, and Troy's going to be doing a lot of this where we'll be talking about those daily bars uh, and trading uh, Forex off the daily chart, uh, in particular with uh, PTU and PTU trend jumpers. So that'll be worthwhile if you haven't attended uh, that webinar before. Go ahead and jump in on that. And the trend jumper is coming out again uh, next Thursday. So if you uh, have been hearing all about the trend jumper and are really interested, uh, definitely check out the blog on that as well. Hopefully you guys have been getting emails on that, and we've sent out the registration links for the webinars. Uh, we'll have two of them next Thursday. So by all means, uh, get yourself signed up for that. And I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it here. We're uh, right at an hour on the dot. Uh, so I definitely want to say uh, thanks to uh, Matt and to John and to Troy. Any closing comments, Troy, from you or, or the folks? Um, you know, TGIF, it's been a great week, but I'm looking forward to two days off. It's my decompression time with the family and be back on Monday. Uh, looking forward to the Trend Jumper release. MT4, huh? The rumor that's coming. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right, all. Have a great weekend.